Believe it or not, I'm actually going to talk about plastic surgery of the face for a change. Um, this video is going to specifically talk about how I look at the nose in terms of the physical characteristics from the top to the bottom. We've mentioned some of this in elliptical fashion, but I thought one element that was really interesting is how the, the top of the nose differs from the bottom of the nose in, in two respects. One is going to be mobility of the tissues, and the second thing is going to be talking more specifically about how the skin moves. So the tip of the nose, if you, you can actually move it very easily. The middle of the nose, by the way, the, just to review the, the architectures, the underlying architecture of the noses, there's something called the lower lateral cartilages right here, then the upper lateral cartilages, and then the nasal bones on the top, almost divided into thirds, if you will, to make it easy. The lower portion of the nose is highly mobile. If you can see, the structures of the cartilage are very mobile. As you get to the middle, they're slightly less mobile. And as you get to the top of the nose, they're relatively rigid in nature. The, so that's one thing to think about just from a mobility standpoint. But what's very interesting, the part that I want to uh, talk about more specifically, is the way that the skin interacts with that cartilage is exactly the opposite, which is almost very in, is fascinating to me, which is that the skin on the tip is very adherent. It just does not move. It's stuck to the bottom of the cartilage. And so you're thinking, because you can move the cartilage, is that the, that the skin must be equally mobile. But you're actually moving the cartilage. The skin is stuck to the cartilage. It cannot move well. It's very adherent. As you go up the nose, you have a little bit more slide. And as you go up to the top of the nose, there's a lot of mobility. So it's almost the exact opposite. The part I want to focus on is this latter part, which is skin mobility vis-a-vis -vis the underlying structure. So again, the great mobility of the lower tip cartilage makes you think that the, the skin is equally mobile there, or it's even more mobile when it's exactly the opposite. How does this apply to anything? I'm going to specifically talk about two ideas to have you better understand this. One is cancer reconstruction of the nose, or any kind of reconstruction from a pos position of scar vision, et cetera. And the other one is injectable rhinoplasty, something a little bit more probably au courant and interesting for you. So let's talk about the more esoteric one, which is the concept of, of having a, a nasal reconstruction. How does this apply? The big thing is when you're reconstructing the tip of the nose and you've, you've cut out skin, for example, you simply can't close it. it it's going to be stuck. It's going to pinch. And you're going to distort the tip. It's gonna, the nostril is going to ride up. You cannot close skin of the tip unless it's microscopically small, in which case I usually would just leave it open anyways, because even if I could close it well, I'm worried about notching the nose in a certain way. Because believe it or not, the lower portion of this, where you think there's cartilage, is actually just all skin. The cartilage is right way, way up here. So so there's a huge risk when you cut on this area to notch the nostrils. So you want to be extremely careful when you're working on the base of the nose when you're talking about trying to excise something, a mole or whatever it may be. Let's go ahead and just cut it and, and hope for the best and try to close that thing. You can't close it. There was a video that I talked about um, earlier, maybe about a month ago, Let the Punishment Fit the Crime, where I alluded to the idea that I had a woman that was a very large mole that was occupying the entire um, central third of her nose. And I said, in that case, I actually did a complete what's called a bilo flap and slid down tissue from the top of the nose, borrowed it, if you will, and slid it down. And the reason for that is twofold. One, the skin won't close, OK? But I thought, in her case, having a lot of incisions that'll take about a year to heal was much better than sitting for the next 40 years of her life with a large mole that was disfiguring. So I let the punishment fit the crime in that case. But that's an example of not being able to close primarily something on the tip of the nose. But people don't understand that when they're dealing with uh, nasal architecture. The other thing that's really important with that, besides nasal distortion, inability to close the tip of the nose, you want to be very careful. I've seen a lot of people use skin grafts to try to move ear, uh, you know, skin tissues on there. And it just does not look good. It looks like a stick of gum stuck on there. Um, one final esoteric point that I think is really interesting that um, it's been a, something I've repeated so many times in a consultation with someone that's seeking a you know, revision of something on the nose is that the most important thing when you're actually working on the nose is to go what's called a subsmass layer, which is a deep layer where the tissues actually glide. In other words, a lot of people, when they're cutting nasal tissue out, they're cutting just through the surface of the skin, just you know, a couple millimeters, and then they close it. It's going to pucker. The blood supply is poor. And it's going to look absolutely horrible. An example is a 21-year-old uh, Asian gentleman that had a scar across here. He, had sought, he, had, he sought a uh, plastic surgery consultation for revision of this scar. And, and fortunately, the plastic surgeon hadn't touched it. And I asked him, what did the plastic surgeon say? Oh, he's just going to cut a little hole here and just you know, suture up. I actually did just cut through there. But then I opened his entire nose deep all the way from here to here to here so that there's no tension on the closure. 
I was below the tissues of what's called the SMAS or uh, it's superficial muscular aponeurotic system. It just is a big fancy word to describe the confluence of muscle and fascia that lies in the mid plane. Well, the blood supply sits through there. So if you just cut on the top end above that in the skin and just make this skin closure, there's tension, bad blood supply, and invariably the skin puckers. So you must understand the nasal architecture being quite different from, from skin architecture. Now let's talk about something more fun, which is injectable rhinoplasty. Injectable rhinoplasty means that you don't want to have a formal rhinoplasty, but you want to inject like some Restylane or some product in there. I do that all the time. One thing is that there's two things you need to know about injectable rhinoplasty. One is the fact that if you're injecting the tip, you're not going to get much change. Because of the, the adherence of the skin to the, to the cartilage below, it just doesn't make much change. And I usually, if I'm injecting, I'll get a minuscule change. But the bridge, I can actually get some good changes when I'm doing injectable rhinoplasty in the area. So that's one thing I, I just want to emphasize is that where the results you're getting are, are along the top of the bridge and more defined as you go up. The other thing that's really important is safety. If someone's really seriously considering a rhinoplasty, I don't like to inject the nose because it's not a virgin nose anymore. They're, the tissue planes can get disrupted, especially if you're putting things like radius, or I'm not, again, not trying to talk about bad about a product, but anytime you start injecting willy-nilly into a nose, my first question before I in, engage in considering an injectable rhinoplasty, is this patient a rhinoplasty candidate? If they're really an excellent rhinoplasty candidate, for example, their hump is so large that I know I'm not gonna get coverage on the top end of it and they're just going to be mildly improved, I discourage them to consider injectable rhinoplasty and move forward with a permanent solution so that they can do the right thing. But if they're truly just saying, you know, I'm just never going to entertain the idea of rhinoplasty or it's very, very low end, I always like to use Restylane or Perlane, a hyaluronic acid based product that's reversible. It'll make my rhinoplasty easier. But in, even in that case, I sort of want someone not to be doing an injectable rhinoplasty if they're seriously considering having a formal rhinoplasty performed in the future. But also, injectable rhinoplasties are great to touch up noses. If there's a little bump here or something not quite right, you know, Restylane, silicone micro, something else can just smooth out those areas, specifically more along the bridge. Again, the tip I've worked with, but very, very hard to really create. Um, a really good result in the area due to the fact that the skin is so adherent to the, to the tissues below. Um, those are some ideas about injectable rhinoplasty and rhinoplasty. I just wanted to have you understand some fundamental natures of the architecture that are re relevant on a clinical nature, and maybe that will be helpful for you when you're discussing um, just as a test to see if your surgeon or physician really understands this architecture well enough to do safe rhinoplasty, safe injectable rhinoplasty, safe scar revision, safe cancer reconstruction of the nose, because the nose architecture does significantly differ from the rest of the face. I'm sorry, I had one more idea that was, was going to escape me, but I wanted to talk about it, which is understanding if we're going to do an injectable, injectable rhinoplasty, everything must be an element of, of balance. So a lot of people I see, they inject a really high bridge, uh, efface a hump, and you want to be careful with that because if you efface the radix, which means there's no radix here, it's just a slope that comes down, the nose looks really weird. So I don't go there and just try to fill a hump until it's gone. I fill a hump when I, up to a point where I can get it um, still looking good and balanced because it's, and it's not just the relationship of the, the top of the nose to where the, the forehead starts because besides not wanting to eliminate that, you also don't want to raise it so high that the tip is swallowed. That's something that's very common in Asians that have a very blunt, short tip, and the doctor is, first of all, not getting ethnic sensitivity about how high to raise the bridge. Oh, just raise it high. Well, first of all, besides looking ugly from the pure fact that the bridge is too high, it's also not relation, it doesn't have a good relationship with the tip. Think about it. If, you know, I always use this example. If a glass of water is floating on a television screen, I ask you how big it is, you have no idea. But if there's a shot glass next to it, it looks huge. And if there's a huge picture next to it, it looks small. So the relationship that I'm, I'm getting to is that if you over-elevate a bridge or overly face a, a, a hump and they've got a relatively smaller blunted tip, that tip will actually just be swallowed up. So everything is proportion. I just want to have you understand that when you're thinking about possible injectable rhinoplasty and realistic expectations.